you know how big the room and, and crowd size would be. Um, and the second one was we want to make sure that we capture and be able to document uh, all the questions uh, that we received tonight and so we can make them part of the formal public record when the board considers the comments. So I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction. How many, uh, show of hands, how many are familiar with the Regional Transit Authority? All right, um, I will say uh, we have a much more educated audience tonight, so it's all breeze through some of these initial slides that we did last night. Um, but wanted to make sure that everybody had an understanding of uh, who we are as an agency. Um, we're a little bit, um, we're a young agency, we're six years old. Uh, we're made up by an enabling statute that has 10 members from across uh, Oakland, Macomb, Wayne, and Washington <laughs> counties. Um, each of those has two members on our board, and then the city of Detroit has one member on our board. Um, and then the chair is appointed by the governor, and uh, he, Paul Hilgans, and he's a non-voting uh, member. So we have a nine-member uh, voting board. Um, the enabling statute back in 2012 gave the RTA some specific functions. And I'll run through those, and then we'll also talk about um, what we are not. And so, uh, by statute, um, hey Ben, can I get you to close that door? Thanks. Uh, by statute, the, the RTA has two key functions. The first of all is to uh, prepare and adopt um, a master transit plan for the region that covers the uh, entire four counties. Um, we also have the authority um, to adopt and implement um, two um, vehicles for implementation, and that's a property tax or vehicle uh, registration fee. And so uh, back in 2016, uh, we adopted our initial master transit plan, went forward, and narrowly, um, that proposal was narrowly defeated. Um, so the RTA then, um, our core mission is to do three things. Um, enhance mobility for the people of Southeast Michigan uh, by providing more resources, improve the quality of life by coordinating with the existing transit providers, and then uh, finally look for opportunities to increase economic development um, through our region. And we do that by administering local programs, coordinating with our providers. Um, everybody should know that who the five providers are. I will just repeat them, just to make sure we're all on the same level playing, playing field tonight. Uh, here within the city of Detroit, DDOT is the operator. They provide both fixed uh, route services uh, across the city and in some neighboring communities, as well as specialized services um, for uh, people with disabilities. Uh, SMART um, provides um, fixed route service uh, across uh, Wayne, bless you, uh, Wayne, uh, Macomb, and Oakland County. Uh, they also provide specialized services through their connector service. Uh, they also provide um, regional express service uh, from the suburb uh, communities down to downtown Detroit. And uh, some of the things in the initial um, 2016 plan, um, SMART has implemented through the FAST, pro their FAST uh, program uh, that they just uh, kicked off uh, the first of the year. Uh, the RIDE um, operates similar services in Washtenaw County, both fixed route and specialized services. People Mover is the circulator downtown, um, and then uh, the, our newest um, operator is the Q Line, operated by M1 Rail. Uh, it's the streetcar line uh, right outside um, the front door here. So, told you about what the role of RTA is. Um, we're developed the plan, program the plan, coordinate with the providers. We will not be doing currently or as part of this plan operating any service, uh, owning and maintaining infrastructure or any of the fleet, uh, collecting or, or keeping the fares, and um, all that will continue to remain with DDOT, SMART, and um, the ride in Ann Arbor. And so we've received questions and we have FAQs 
um, will this service, will this plan replace DDOT? Will it replace SMART? Will it replace the ride? No. Everything that we're doing was is proposed as part of this plan is additive on top of those existing services that those agencies provide. What this does is it increases the frequency, um, increases the duration of service, and provides a lot more resources for those agencies to carry out their respective missions. Um, you see on the screen on the left hand side one box that's gray and one of the elements of the RTA is that uh, as part of our enabling legislation we are required if we implement a, a, um, a property tax or vehicle registration um, that 85% of that money that we collect for these additional services must be spent in the member jurisdiction where those um, funds are collected. And so it's uh, a key component of this plan. This plan was developed to be fully compliant with that 85%. So every community in the plan that we talk about here tonight gets at least 85% of their millage dollars back and overall um, uh, more investment. And Jeremy will talk about those details. So let's talk about, um, apologize there. How, why is it that we got to this point tonight? What happened to uh, talk about this plan and, and how it came to be? Um, so after the narrow defeat in 2016, uh, the RTA began a session going around and talking to stakeholders um, across the entire region, saying, you know, what was it that was not provided? Um, and what, what needs to change if we were to move forward with a, with a new vision or a new plan? Um, Parallel to that, and then um, most recently, um, our elected leadership across the region really took uh, ownership of this plan, something that um, did not happen before, uh, but they, they realized the importance and they sat down uh, in collaboration with the RTA and they said, uh, these are the things that if this plan is going to be successful moving forward, we need to have uh, more local control, we need to have more service, we need to have less capital improvement um, and more service through longer periods uh, throughout the day. And so what you see in the plan that Jeremy's going to go through, um, it really reflects uh, over a year of feedback, of comments, of stakeholder input, of provider inputs, and our uh, leadership from uh, all four counties. Uh, have the fingerprints all over this plan. And we believe it's a much better version. Um, you hear the expression, hindsight's being 2020. Uh, I believe that if we would have done, taken a lot of the steps that we've done since 2016, we probably wouldn't be in this room, but we'd rather be implementing. So um, I believe strongly that this is a better plan and uh, look forward to the comments and feedback that we receive uh, tonight to see if, um, you concur if there's other areas that we need to improve. Like I said, um, I've covered many of these, but the, these are the main themes that uh, we heard lots of feedback across the entire region. But these sort of four, four themes are the core ones that we have revised moving forward. And so what you're going to see Jeremy talk about is um, the capital components of this plan, the BRT routes on Woodward, Gratiot, um, Um, along Gratiot, Woodward, Michigan, Grand River, um, those elements have been replaced with more uh, service, uh, with greater frequency uh, across not only north-south routes, but also east-west, um, connecting uh, Oakland to Macomb, uh, Wayne to Washtenaw, uh, Western Wayne to uh, downtown, Western Wayne to, to Washtenaw. Uh, more local control, a lot more flexibility in this plan. Uh, one of the things that we heard from the leadership is um, we need tools in the toolbox to be able to be responsive uh, not only as population and demographics change but also as technology and that's the, the last bullet on the, the slide. 2016 presented a plan that was based on you know, current transportation technology where we were at in 2016. Um, this provides money for us to be future forward looking and looking at alternatives um, that may involve uh, connected and autonomous vehicles. 
the way we move, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, this plan looks out at a 20 year horizon and provides money for services out 20 years. It needs to be flexible. So we heard that loud and clear. So there's four main themes, more, four main themes um, that uh, the plan is built around. It's the improvement of frequency and reliability, modernization and innovation, more local input, and uh, providing a seamless rider experience. So um, I'm going to allow Jeremy Puga to come up and talk about more of the specifics of what's in the plan. Uh, good evening, everybody. Can you guys hear my voice okay in the back room? Okay, great. Uh, grateful for the opportunity to be here to present this plan to you all tonight, and I'm glad you're here to uh, allow us uh, to share it with you. So uh, when Matt talks about more operations, this uh, slide really exemplifies that. This is our 15 routes at 15 minute frequencies. Um, this is really where the rubber meets the road in terms of improving operations, uh, quite literally. Um, included in this plan is an additional 1,400 hours of frequent service every every weekday. So um, as part of the uh, 15 at 15 uh, corridors, there are five premium corridors. Those corridors are Mound Bay Lake, Gratiot, Grand River, Woodward, and Michigan. And those are premium routes because in addition to the frequency of service, they'll also receive $210 million of capital improvements as well to ensure that those services are able to maintain uh, speed and reliability on those corridors. In addition to those five premium corridors, there are 10 additional upgraded cross-county corridors that you see heading east and west across the map uh, with services uh, of 20 hours a day. Next up are our express services. We heard uh, two things loud and clear as part of the 2016 effort. Uh, we need to maintain and uh, improve no. ease, of, ease of access to DTW, the Detroit Metro Airport. So we've got uh, three new express routes. The Ann Arbor to Detroit current um, airport express route will be maintained. We've got seven trips uh, daily, 365 days a year. So there's new airport express routes connecting each of the four counties directly to uh, Detroit Wayne County Airport. We also heard that uh, what we really needed in this region was direct express service to primary job centers throughout the region. So this direct express service is exemplified on the map with the blue lines that are uh, along all the major highway corridors. There are 11 new express routes with uh, hourly service, eight hours a day, 15 new park and ride lots. So these services are intended to provide express service to job centers, limited stops along major highway corridors. Commuter rail, um, rail improvements in this plan, uh, Ann Arbor to Detroit, eight round trips per day. Um, there's eight round trips a day. It'll take a little while for uh, that Ann Arbor rail service to be implemented. So in the meantime, there'll be an Ann Arbor to Detroit express bus um, along that corridor, uh, implementing service uh, prior to the the, um, the fixed rail service. Q line, the RTA will assume operations of the Q line in 2027. In addition to support uh, the commuter rail service, there are new local feeder bus routes: Ann Arbor to Ypsilanti. Ypsilanti to Livonia, Livonia to Merriman Road to support uh, services to the uh, regional rail. Now the next two categories that I'm going to cover are a direct response to uh, us hearing that we would like there was a, a, a need for more local control over the plan. There are uh, mobility needs out there in the region that cannot be served adequately by just fixed route transit lines on a map. So the core area of flexible mobility program of $20 million annually is intended to provide creative solutions to expand paratransit funding, 
expand opportunities, mobility options for seniors, and also create that first and last mile connection is often missing from a transit trip from your origin or your destination. So really, again, it's a, it's a program where local communities can determine what the best needs are for their, their, their uh, local community members and implement the type of service that meets those needs. So flexible program, again, allows us to respond to te technology and innovation, as Matt had mentioned previously, but also uh, expands our transit options beyond the lines on the map. Hometown services, this is the area in, in orange highlighted on this map, $30 million a year. So one of the things that um, part of the, the initial 2016 plan we heard is that those outlying areas in the region weren't really getting uh, or receiving benefit to, uh, of the transit plan. And again, this is a, a, a locally developed plan that, uh, uh, that will allow local agencies to determine the best needs for their community. Um, the over 65 population in the hometown service area is going to grow by 140% over the next 20 to 30 years. And as we went out there and talked to some of those communities, we found that the needs that they have in their community have doubled over the last four to five years. And so they're already seeing this increase in demand out there. And so the hometown services are a, a vehicle that can help them prepare for the, the, the increased needs that are forecast in the future, but also meet their immediate needs today. So. Um, community design services, again, very similar to uh, core uh, area flexible mobility program. Um, call and ride uh, services are an option. Regional connections, a lot of folks that live in the hometown service area, their primary job centers aren't downtown Detroit. Their primary job centers are places like Pontiac, Troy, other areas that are not all the way into the, the center of the metro area, and they need those connections. So. Um, regional connections can help uh, make those job center connections for them. Uh, volunteer operators, ride sharing partnerships, you know, the mobility needs in those communities are, 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 are unique and they found unique ways to address them and so uh, supporting volunteer driver programs and also uh, services for homebound uh, individuals is also options under this program to meet their mobility needs. There are several regional initiatives that are part of this new plan. Uh, one that, that I'm really excited about is this uh, advanced mobility program, and, and Matt uh, alluded to it earlier, but this is one of the primary programs that are gonna give this region an opportunity to be the leader of future mobility. $20 million per year um, is, supposed, is intended to leverage private sector investment to be led by each individual county. Um, this is the sort of investment that can help move the needle on autonomous and connected vehicle service implementation in Southeast Michigan. Southeast Michigan has been, has led the world uh, for uh, automobile, develop, automobile development. There's no reason why our region can't lead the world in mobility uh, development and being at the cutting edge of mobility. And um, this program is intended to make a commitment to help us get there. A few other um, Regional initiatives that I'd like to cover. Uh, the first is the check choke point reduction program. You know, we've been hearing that uh, you know, the needs of our region go beyond uh, just service, but we've got infrastructure needs as well. And so the choke point reduction program is intended to target transit routes and reduce conditions that cause slowdowns on those routes. So it's a surgical approach to determining you know, what areas are impacting our services the most and impacting uh, the traveling public the most, and there's $25 million annually for infrastructure upgrades, such as signal priority, transit lanes at intersections where there are bottlenecks to help improve both the reliability and, and speed of the services that are not only out there today, but they're out there as part of this plan. Funding for new and updated bus garages, uh, having a efficient and reliable service means having well-maintained vehicles and, um, and state-of-the-art equipment to do that. So updated bus garages. Um, and one of the things that's important to note also, DDOT and AAATA, the ride in Ann Arbor, they've got limited capacity to add fleet. And if we're going to uh, implement all the uh, service frequencies that we've got included in this plan, having capacity of those garages is going to be very important to make that happen. And last uh, but not least is also the fare integration program and the universal fare card. Um, 
How many bus riders do I have in the room? You know, you all can probably attest that a regionally integrated fare program uh, will go a long way uh, to help improve the mobility of the users of the system and also the convenience. And so there'll be uh, mobile apps available, it'll be compatible with all services, and it'll really create a seamless customer experience for everybody, no matter what service you're using in the region. And finally, uh, future rapid corridor infrastructure planning and design. You know, this plan gets us much closer to our vision of transit in this region, but there's still more, more work to be done, so there's funds available to continue to plan for future rapid corridor infrastructure. Some examples would be light rail to DTW, streetcar, expanded commuter rail service. Um, we feel like this plan is, is getting us started, um, and there's more in the future, and this funding categories will help us get there. It's important to note the financial building blocks of the plan. Um, so the, the, the plan that we put, that, put together uh, is largely based off the, the financial model that was developed in 2016 that was peer reviewed by a panel of regional experts. Um, since that time, we've made five major updates uh, throughout 2017 and beginning of 2018 that include updating taxable value, um, tax capture information from the counties, using the most uh, up-to-date forecast from SEMCOD for uh, population projections, uh, operating costs and service levels. We've gotten input from the providers to make sure that they've got the latest and greatest information in there. And we've also adjusted our cost allocations uh, based on new routes. And then since that time, um, we've also had uh, all the counties and state Detroit have an opportunity to review it, as well as the providers. This is my last slide before I, I hand it back over to Matt. This is the dollars and cents. Again, in the RTA legislation, it does require 85% of the revenues raised in each county be returned to each of those counties and projects. We do meet that 85% millage requirement in each of those counties. And if you add in the additional revenues that are leveraged from the millage funds that are raised, each of those counties get more than 100% return on their investment into the program. Oops. There's the image for that last slide. Sorry, I forgot to answer. <coughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so one of the questions we get, um, we've heard many times at uh, both the board level as well as uh, you know, we've heard uh, last night, why, why is this a priority now? Is it only because we have an opportunity in uh, the general election to move this forward? Um, the answer is no. You know, the, the RTA um, learned a lot of lessons from that 2016 ballot. And it really goes back to our mission, which is looking to enhance mobility options, providing more resources uh, to our existing transit providers uh, so that they can uh, improve quality of life and expand economic development. And so why is this important now? Uh, a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, we as a region are aging. Um, myself included, as we get uh, uh, older and older, we need more and more uh, transportation options. And uh, the, the stat that Jeremy had in the hometown service, um, you know, this plan looks out that far. We need to be able to make sure that we are providing flexible service across the entire, entire region. Um, the the uh, 15 routes uh, increases fre frequency 68%. Um, uh, than from what we have today. That's able to, for elderly people to connect to doctors, to you know, dentists, to um, you know, family, to other, purpose, other purposes, shopping, et cetera, uh, where you don't need to get in your car and drive you know, a couple miles across, across town, across the county. Um, you can do that throughout the entire day. Um, yeah, at the other end of the spectrum, how many millennials do I have in the room? Show of hands. Absolutely, we have a huge number of millennials staying within uh, our region, which is great. It's great, right? We're not moving away like they did in my generation. Um, but you know, they, they want to move and and uh, move across our region differently. And so, you know, they're looking at cranes did the survey. Seventy-three percent don't want to have a car. I have a kid; my son's driving age. 
He doesn't want to have the car. He wants to have his head down and just do this. <laughs> okay? And so we need to be responsive um, to make sure that Southeast Michigan is the region that's accommodating all of them. Oh. Finally, the last last reason, and Jeremy hit on it, I talked about it, is that autonomous vehicle technology. Um, you know, we heard from the Amazon example that you know South Southeast Michigan is not one of the top uh, 25. Um, when we compare ourselves to uh, other peer regions, we rank 24th out of 25 in similar peers. And if you look at those communities, Indianapolis, Nashville, Columbus, Atlanta are all currently investing in their transportation system. And so we need more resources so the fine folks at DDOT, SMART, Mirai, Q-Line continue to provide more services for our region. That's why we're here tonight. That's why we're putting this plan forward. Thank you. Um, sorry, I was advancing on the computer. Um, you can see the, see the numbers that back that up. Um, but that's why, that's why this plan is, is so important. That's why now is the time to have this robust discussion. So we are here to listen. Um, I'm uh, going to uh, turn the mic over to Elnora here shortly. Want to talk about next steps. We've heard, you know, what's it take to get the plan approved? What's it take to get the ballot, uh, this plan on the ballot like we did in 2016? Two steps are required. First of all, our board will be taking all the comment and feedback that we hear over the next um, two to three weeks. Um, we'll be presenting that, compiling that, and presenting it to our uh, board committees. Uh, the committees will review, um, make any modifications to the plan, and then we'll uh, take uh, action on whether to approve that plan by a unanimous vote. Um, if they do, then the second step can happen, and that is um, look at potentially putting this and looking at uh, implementation measures uh, on a ballot or looking at other implementation measures uh, to put a, um, a ballot referendum um, on the November ballot of 2018. We need to have um, both our committees review, we have a funding and allocation committee, which is made up of one member jurisdiction, they have to unanimously support that and recommend to the board that it gets approved. And then ultimately the board, uh, by Michigan statute, needs to, needs to approve um, seven nights uh, of our board. So seven members out of the nine need to approve it. We need at least one member from each um, member jurisdiction to say yes, uh, called the supermajority um, vote. So uh, we'll be looking at this, like I said, over the next 30 to 60 days, um, so the time is now to hear your feedback. So with that, I'm going to turn things uh, over to Elnora, um, and we will uh, have an open discussion. Better? Better. Okay. So Lonnie Peek is in the back of the room and he is going to collect your question card. So if you have a question or a comment, please write it down and hand it to Lonnie. He'll bring it up to me. I'll read it and then the gentleman here will answer the question if I cannot. And I cannot answer the question, so you'll definitely be hearing from them. Okay, our first question. Will there ever be an overhead line? So, um, I'm assuming you're referring to like the people mover the line? Yeah. Um, so, one of the things that uh, this plan looks at uh, is not included as part of this plan. Um, one of the lessons that we heard and to implement a people mover type overhead monorail type system is very capital cost intensive and most capital projects like that require uh, federal money from federal discretionary funds from Federal Transit Administration. 
and those funds are extremely tight. So what this plan has done is shifted the burden of placing and asking and, and hoping and expecting Washington to pay for transit services and move that more, more regionally and locally. So there's not money in the plan to do an overhead uh, monorail type system, um, but what we do have in there is more services that we can deliver faster with money that we raise locally and can essentially control our own destination. Okay. I am a big supporter of the RTA Michigan, thank you, and voted for the referendum and thank you again. Um, I am a ride-sharing driver, partner with Uber and Lyft. What can I do to be the best possible partner for the Connect Southeast Michigan plan? Educate, educate, educate. Um, you know, that's really a function of the RTA. Um, that's what we're doing here tonight. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, if, if you know, this vision is, is carried forward, um, certainly we want to look at partnerships with those last mile providers um, like Jeremy talked about in the plan. And so, um, you know, other regions are starting to implement pilot projects and even uh, funding Uber and Lyft subsidies um, to provide those connections to more of the fixed route services. And so those are some of the things that have been built into the plan and, um, you know, some of the things that, you know, we feel that the region um, deserves to have those types of services. Well, ben, if you want to add anything else? Actually, this is a related question and you've sort of touched on it, but um, will you be considering contracted services such as Uber and Lyft to provide for the last mile service? Sure, so the, uh, the core area mobility program and the hometown service program that Jeremy described, um, we would be looking at uh, uh, being able to partner with those types of services. We could also partner with local providers, DDOT, Smart, uh, potentially taxi companies to actually provide those first last mile services. So there's lots of options in how you provide that service. It doesn't necessarily just need to be Uber and Lyft. Um, but that is the purpose of that service is to find ways to get that first and last mile done. This is a three-part question. Has there been a comprehensive study in regard to demographics? That's part one. Um, are they going to merge the bus systems, DDOT and SMART? And will they have a seamless transfer service to the triple ATA ride? Um, I'm assuming uh, the, the demographics question is basically how did we look at the existing population and jobs and kind of determine where the routes were going to be. And yes, um, there was, uh, particularly in the original 2016 plan, there was a comprehensive review of population densities, employment densities, transit need, um, and analysis done at the regional level to identify um, places that have a higher need for transit. And we actually were able to transfer that need into service levels. So when we look at places, um, we're able to say, based on the needs we've assessed here, a 15 minute bus service could, you know, could actually have, uh, take hold here in this demographic area. So that was done um, in the uh, 2016 plan and, and updated for, for this plan. What was the third question? I'm gonna do the third one too. Sorry. The third question was, um, let's see. <laughs> Seamless transfers to Triple ATA. So the, the connection to Triple ATA in the plan right now, um, there's the, the commuter rail, um, so there's a physical um, physical connection to the Ann Arbor service area. Um, there will be a fare card and integration with Triple ATA in terms of being able to have an integrated fare. So that's what the plan envisions. Can you repeat the second question? Oh, you guys, come on. <laughs> and and while you're looking for that, I, I neglected to introduce. Uh, this is Ben, ben Suka. Um, uh, I'm sure a familiar face to many of you. Uh, he's our uh, RTA planning director. Okay. So question number two was, um, are they going to merge the bus systems, DDOT and SMART? So 
Um, as part of this plan, one of the things that, um, you know, the initial um, rollout is looking at with the existing providers. Um, there are opportunities, and one of the themes that we heard was uh, looking for efficiencies um, and opportunities for savings. I think all the providers are, you know, they do the best they can with the resources that they have. Um, and so I would expect that that would be continuing uh, some of the themes um, as we move forward. So um, nothing specifically called out, but uh, certainly, um, you know, opportunities for greater partnership and collaboration across the entire region. But, uh, Omar, I think it's important to emphasize the systems would not be merged. Under Correct. Under, under the initial plan, um, there is no, you know, Merger, there's no RTA coming in and operating everything. Um, you know, the contracted services that we have met with the existing agencies, the existing providers, and for example, the 15, uh, 15 minute for 15 route services. We, you know, have made assumptions that you know, DDOT's going to operate this route, Smart's going to operate that route. We'll sit down and have a whole heck of a lot more conversations. Um, you know, moving forward, if the plan and those routes are, you know, agreed through this public comment period. Next question. Has any consideration been made for bus shelters at transfer points for those that ride all the providers in the RTA? Um, so that, that, that's a great question. So uh, part of the infrastructure investments on the uh, 15 for 15 routes uh, does allow for uh, bus shelter improvements and upgrades for those stops that are, are busiest. So uh, there are opportunities for those infrastructure investments. Um, we also did look at the core area mobility program and hometown service program. That there be a possibility of potentially capital investments if there's a community that particularly wants to upgrade its shelters, uh, that can be something they can pursue possibly through one of those two programs as well. This is a very good question. How will everyday essential bus riders, those who rely on the bus for education, work, leisure, medical, and social services access in the city of Detroit, benefit from this new plan? So, multiple benefits, and it, it, that's an excellent question. Um, so, providing more resources to DDOT uh, to be able to expand the services, the frequency, as I said, 68%, um, you know, DDOT provides great service during peak, uh, but off peak, you know, they aren't able to maintain that level of frequency throughout their current day with the resources that, they're ha they're, that they have. They're constrained. So this plan does that. It provides additional resources for rider um, enhancements, um, additional resources. One of the challenges DDOT has for expansion of service right now is um, garage space. And so this, you know, provides new facilities, so it allows us to expand. Um, the other thing is the choke point program. Um, you know, I can go on and on and on, but you know, the choke, choke point, that's, it's not only benefiting buses, getting buses through intersections where now you, the signals aren't coordinated along a corridor, you go from one intersection to another and then you stop. This, does transit priority and allows buses to move through those intersections, benefiting not only buses but also vehicular traffic that are driving on those roads and makes our system, uh, it, it goes back to that theme of modernizing our entire transportation system. Actually, you answered the question I always want to ask you to answer, which is, what is a choke point? And you have answered that question. Thank you. Right. What are the biggest concerns and fears by voters and politicians? Touchy question always. Um, how do you plan to address them? So our plan um, tonight is to take public feedback and comment and take that back to the board. Um, ultimately what happens at a political level, you know, none of us up at the front of the room can control. Um, you know, I, I definitely won't speak for any of the political leaders across the region, but I, I can tell you that um, they've all been involved. Um, they've all had their staff dedicating many, many, many hours. And, um, you know, I think there is consensus that the overall plan 
is much better than the 2016 version. Um, I think there's challenges about how we implement that, and you know the elected leadership will come together and decide how we move that forward. This is a five-part question. <laughs> we need two volunteers to come up. <laughs> I am not going to test you. I will give them to you one at a time. Number one, where can I find detailed financial information on the framework, i.e., for particular services, how much is raised annually, etc. Yep, excellent, excellent question. So uh, the financial um, summary as far as the capital costs and the annual operating costs, um, if you go on the RTA website, www.michigan, uh, or rtamichigan.org, um, this document is in here and it provides a description of the services and then it also has the capital and the annual operating costs in it. Um, the other thing that uh, we are doing is in the midst of um, reviewing the financial models. We've already sat down and reviewed them with each of the providers. We've done that with the elected leadership. Uh, we're moving forward and presenting it to the RTA board uh, next month. And then once the uh, RTA board has a chance to review, comment on the detailed fi finances of this plan, that um, financial executive, um, the executive uh, finances of the assumptions of this will then also be put online and made public for um, all review. Question two. How will hometown services be planned and coordinated on a municipal, county, and regional level? Sure. Um, so the way the hometown service program is conceived as of now um, is that each sorry each uh, municipality in that program will get basically uh, an allotment of funding, um, and we would then work with each one of them to develop the services based on their need. Uh, we would have to figure out a way to um, kind of cap that if there's a if there's a uh, municipality that doesn't need that much funding or a municipality that needs more or less. Um, so we're trying to figure out the mechanics of that now. Um, I can also say we've had some positive conversations with uh, municipalities in Oakland County and kind of northern Oakland County uh, to talk about their desire to consolidate some of their senior services and partner with their uh, just kind of uh, just you know next door jurisdictions and trying to kind of expand those services. So we are looking at opportunities to do that. So you actually just answered question three, which was, how will hometown services be implemented to increase, increase coordination between transfer services? Done. So it's like you have, like, All right. it's like you have ESP or something? I know what they mean. Uh. <laughs> Describe the plan for paratransit, ADA, non-ADA, across the region. All right. Um, so the idea for the paratransit service, so how many people know what paratransit service is, more or less, not a t some, okay, more, okay. Um, so we use the term paratransit services, it's a very specific um, type of service that each one of our existing service providers does. Um, it is specifically uh, available for people with disabilities. Um, smart service is unique in that it also provides senior services. It's not a common thing that you see, but it, but they do do it with smart. So the idea in the plan is that areas where we're putting new service, so uh, Novi would be a good example, would see an expansion of that base um, smart service. So that's the first thing we want to do is if we're expanding service, we're legally mandated to expand that service to the, to the kind of edges of what we call the fixed route service area. Then we want to work with Smart and DDOT to address a few policy issues in terms of people needing to transfer between the two systems, paratransit uh, riders need to uh, transfer between the two systems. We also want to look at being able to uh, provide uh, more availability so you can get closer to either day of or one day before being able to book a trip. So right now for these services you need usually two to three days to be able to book a trip. Uh, we want to see if we can provide a little bit more funding to uh, allow people to book, maybe not quite on demand, but a little bit closer to when they need. So those are just a couple of the, the pieces in that program. And Ben, can you also um, tell us how uh, much money is allocated for the ADA services? So the uh, core area mobility program is $20 million a year. Uh, the ADA expansion, I would have 
that piece of, of the pot. And just for context, um, I believe uh, between Smart and DDOT, they're spending just a little bit over that amount currently annually for paratransit services. So um, just to, again, give context, it's probably 26 to 30 million they're spending, and this is 20 million a year. This question I think we have answered, but I'm going to read it in case anyone wants to add anything to it. The question is essentially, um, will the citizens get the benefit um, of the plan if it passes, if the millage passes in November? So I would say, yes, you will get the you will get all sorts of benefits if the millage passes in November. So I'll take that question. How about that? Very well. Did so well, I think you should take the next one. All right. Let's just let's just see what this has to say. Okay. Will the queue line be expanded to 10 mile <laughs> or 12 mile? Um, will the RTA invest, invest excuse me, in a Jefferson Avenue streetcar in the future? Actually, I could answer that question, but you go ahead. Sure. <clears throat> so, what is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what's been included in the plan is uh, planning funds to look at uh, where our uh, transit, some of our transit invest, investment uh, needs to happen further down the road. Uh, again, the focus of this is getting service on the street, uh, expanding that service. But we do have money in there to look at planning and feasibility for uh, streetcar expansion within the city of Detroit. Um, not necessarily up to um, 10 mile or um, any of those, and, and certainly not, I wanna make sure it's clear, certainly not um, construction or operation or anything like that. But. Uh, Jefferson Avenue is, you know, a possibility um, extending the queue line further to the north. Um, you know, that money for planning and feasibility is included in this uh, plan. Um, so I'm going to read this, but if the person who wrote it thinks I'm not reading it correctly, they should tell me so. Will interest in our auto industry in the area slow down or be impeded by the implementation of the best transit plan possible? Um, my response to that, and again, I'm not uh, in the day-to-day -day auto industry, uh, but it would be absolutely not. You know, I think the auto industry is looking at how they can uh, retool and prepare for the future with autonomous vehicles. Um, you know, there's national research out there that says um, anywhere between, you know, 20, 2020, 2022, all the way out to, you know, 2040, the integration of, you know, fully autonomous, integrated, you know, driverless vehicles, it's on the way. And so, um, I know there's a ton of R&D going on in this region, um, and you know, you look at what the uh, automakers in this region are doing. You know, Ford rolled out their uh, program uh, with their uh, van to um, their van to medical service uh, just recently. So, you know, that's a that's a concrete example that's happening right in our backyard. That you know, I think the auto the auto industry, and I'm, I'm sure there's probably folks that work in the auto industry, a couple of hands. Um, you know, I, I think they're definitely looking to the future. Uh, this plan looks at the future, and you know, those two need to go uh, move forward um, step, step by step, locked together. The plan doesn't address pay disparity of drivers. Will there be pay parity between DDOT and SMART? That's a, yeah, excellent, excellent question. Um, so what um, the plan does is provide uh, funding, um, and it, we made that much more clear in this version. It provides plan money to then contract with DDOT, SMART, and the RIDE as uh, operators of that system. Um, ultimately, labor contracts are with between the operators and um, the owning agency and so you know nothing in this plan speaks specific to that issue but um, you know it definitely does provide more resources for uh, each of the um, underlying agencies 
why were new local bus routes in western Lane County, that is to say Livonia, Canton, etc., why were they eliminated from this plan? No um, one seems to want to answer yeah. this question. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, um, yeah I, I don't know uh, the specifics of why. I think I you know, know some more specifics about which, which routes uh, rep you're referencing. But uh, you know, as Matt mentioned at the outset of uh, the program, you know, we did take a lot of the feedback that we heard back from 2016. Um, we also uh, took feedback from the local elected leadership on what um, they thought uh, the plan would benefit uh, their, their constituents. So the plan is largely uh, uh, constructed from everything we heard from 2016 up until today. And we also heard from the leadership. So if there um, are routes that are not in there um, and that you'd like included, that's why we're here today. I've heard comments from other folks of things that they've seen missing in the plan that they want included. And so we do look at those com comments and do our best to uh, implement everything that's within the spirit of the plan. So, um, if you have those, please fill out a comment card and make sure you get it done. Or do a video comment. We would love to have you do video comments, um, which we would put on our website and our Facebook page, etc. So don't be shy. Afterward, we'd love it if you'd stop and give us a comment. Elnora, can I, can I add one more thing to that? Yes. Um, again, one of the common themes I've said a lot tonight is flexibility. And so in the core program, just like you had in the hometown service, um, it provides additional fun uh, funding in the core areas as well for communities to come up and say, we want this type of service that best meets our, our you know, community's needs. So if those communities come um, and want to use a portion of that core money uh, for expanded service, for example, in Western Lane, uh, not only do you have the fixed commuter express type service, you know, you have that option as well. And, you know, again, the reason why we made that flexible is we, we understand services change, communities change, transportation change. This is a 20 year plan. We have to be flexible and nimble. Um, and we think this plan does do that. Can you give an example of where and how street cars, street cars fit into rapid transit? Actually, I can answer that one. So, well, I spent 12 years in the city of Boston riding uh, streetcars, and they're very much a part of an integrated system, or can be a part of an integrated system. Okay, and now you can take it from there. Yeah, very good. Uh, several several uh, communities um, across our, our country, and then also internationally, have rapid transit type systems, bus rapid transit, uh, uh, light rail transit, commuter rail type transit that does interface. Um, you know, some of the keys for a connected seamless system um, is having that integrated fare service. So you can go from one service to another and not have to worry about transfers and um, you know, the, the logistics of that, making the system friendly for users, both um, existing transit riders as well as folks that don't ride that um, and so you know I would say you know I can I can count many systems um, Salt Lake City Portland um, you know Atlanta you know they all have streetcars they all have you know bus rapid transit Seattle um, Ben could probably race circles around me <laughs> uh, with with his knowledge but um, you know, it's key that we have that that uh, integration, and you know, I think we're seeing some of that. You know, especially with Smart's fast service coming in, and um, you know, we're seeing more and more of that type of service. It's just, you know, we need more resources to expand it across, you know, a very large regions. This is a comment, but you'll know why I'm reading it when I read it. <clears throat> it says. I hope the RTA does more community outreach, that's my job, um, to spread awareness about the plan in terms of how we can vote on it and what else we need to know. So, yes, I agree. And, and I would echo that and um, again, thank all of you for coming out. We've got a great turnout. Um, it's you folks that will ultimately make a difference 
and showing you know our board, our elected officials that this is a priority for our region. So, um, you know, on behalf of all of us in front of the room, thank you for coming out. On that note, if I may, I want to make clear, as you mentioned, that you know this plan doesn't make it to the ballot unless <coughs> Patterson and Mark Hackle uh, allow it onto the ballot. So, if anyone here is from Oakland or Macomb County or know people in Oakland or Macomb County, please have them call their county executives and tell them. We need transit on the ballot this year. Thanks. Um. Okay, all right. We're we're going back to the questions now. <laughs> Thank you. That was a word from not our sponsor, but one of our transit advocates, our beloved transit advocates. So thank you for that. But no more disruptions. <laughs> the regional CEO group is advocating for regional transit. Are they making an impact? What are your thoughts about their level of involvement and potential find potential funding models, including corporation potential funding models, including corporations? Um, yeah, I, I think what what you're hearing is that um, you know we heard some of that in '16, and it's continuing to get louder. And um, this region, we heard it loud and clear from you know the Amazon response. Um, you know, all of us at the front of the room, uh, many of you probably worked on that proposal. Um, I've been working in, in this industry in, in Detroit for probably, um, in the industry for 20 and in Detroit, uh, Metro Detroit for over 15 and I've never seen our region come together more collaboratively and work together on, on such a proposal. Um, it was exciting um, and you know we can do great things um, but uh, you know, I think it does take, it, it takes a tribe um, to borrow that phrase and it takes many voices and um, so the business, um, you know, it's becoming, workforce development is a huge issue, you know, as, as baby boomers retire, finding employers, uh, employers finding employees, um, you know, to do that, it, it requires that we provide that good access and that we're competing against other regions. And um, so I think that's sort of the message that, that I heard from the, the business community. Um, and I think, uh, you know, they're starting to voice their, their needs uh, for us to have expanded transit. I don't know, Ben or Jeremy, you want to add anything to that? I'd like to add to that, and that is that there was a letter in the Crazy Detroit Business by someone saying that the CEO should pay for the transit system. And what's kind of funny is that when you look at the queue line, I think our CEO stepped up to the place there helping fund the system, the transit, the uh, stations and everything like that. And I hope the RTA will also push that is giving uh, the executive something to fund, especially a high speed rail or a, a rail line to the airport, so we can have such a huge step down in service, let them help fund the stations uh, where their businesses are. Like, or the board, that sort of thing, but push them, and uh, I don't think there's any question that our CEOs will step up and play on that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Back to our questions. You mentioned municipalities will get 100% return on investment on the millage. How long will that take? That's part one. And also, can you explain more in detail the main differences between the 2016 plan and this one? I'll take the first part and then uh, I'll turn it over to you two to take the second part, uh, Jeremy. Uh, so the first part, 85% uh, compliance. So as part of the 2016 um, referendum, um, <clears throat> the RTA developed a policy um, that said, described exactly how the 85% compliance um, would be monitored. And so um, the RTA has an existing policy that requires essentially an annual true up, um, looking at how much revenue is brought in on an annual basis from that millage, making sure that the services um, that have been provided over that year uh, equal at least 85% or greater um, across all the member jurisdictions. And so um, that policy is in place. 
Uh, we obviously can revisit that. The board can revisit that, but um, certainly that that has been put in place um, by statute, and uh, the RTA, um, if they choose, if the RTA board moves uh, forward, that'll be one of our core functions to make sure that we have the proper controls uh, in place to assure our member communities get 85% return on the dollar. Okay, um, to the, uh, the question in regards to uh, the biggest differences between the 2018 and 2016 plan, I think uh, in broad strokes it could come down to more, more operation service on the ground, so the 15 minutes, 15 rounds of 15 minutes is a great, is a perfect example of that. Um, less infrastructure investment, and that infrastructure investment that we're making, it's not targeted blanket over three primary corridors like the initial plan was. Um, our infrastructure investments are now able to target hot, hot spots, or as Elmora favorite term, choke points throughout the region, new areas of congestion. We're able to target those with our infrastructure funds. Uh, I'd also describe it as more flexible. Um, these programmatic dollars in both the hometown services, the core area of flexible mobility, and, and the innovation program are, are flexible. So they allow us to make sure that we're implementing the most appropriate service over a over a, a 20, 20 year period. And I think lastly, uh, Matt, Matt touched on this, I think it's important to to, to re reiterate it one more time, is um, we're not relying on competitive federal grant programs. The federal dollars in this program are largely uh, formula funds. Um, so non-competitive, come back to our region by way of formula. And there's less reliance on the federal dollars. We're relying on locally generated uh, uh, millage funds to implement this plan. And someone had that very question here that you have just answered, which is, um, how do we uh, reduce our de dependence on discretionary grants? And you just answered that very nicely. And now here is my favorite question. If choke points are confusing, here's my favorite confusing topic. What is the difference between 85% tax revenue and 85% return of millage revenue? And I think what they want you to describe is maybe the, is it the 85% rule? The person is quite, the, No. Well, that was an easy one. Someone has very teeny tiny handwriting. What will be involved in achieving the super majority? So this person wants to understand what the super majority vote is. Yep, uh, very good question. Um, it is confusing. Um, take some time to uh, understand. So the um, so the board is made up of nine members, nine voting members. Um, the super majority for a ballot initiative uh, to be placed on uh, a general election, and we do have to, we can't go uh, off years. It has to be in either a presidential or gubernatorial election, uh, even years. Um, the, the super majority is that every we need at least seven yes votes out of our nine voting members and then at least one member from each of the member jurisdictions so one member from Wayne, Oakland, Washtenaw, Macomb and then the city of Detroit must also vote yes and so we can't have uh, for example um, everybody voting yes except the city of Detroit as an example um, that would still not put it on the ballot. What will the $210 million in capital improvements on the five premium routes go for? Um, will they go toward dedicated lanes and transit centers? So um, that's a tough question to answer because I think it's very corridor specific, but some of the examples that we envision that it would address would be a Q jump lanes at intersections. So um, maybe a portion of a dedicated lane and a Q jump at intersection to allow um, 
the transit vehicle to minimize its uh, its uh, its the time it dwells at a, an intersection. Yeah. yeah. So, yes. Thank you for that. Yeah, so a Q jump would be it's a, a lane that would allow the bus uh, to go around uh, the the traffic that's at a intersection and get to the front of the line to be at the front of the line to move when the light turns green. Another option would be pre-boarding payment that also helps speed up service. So if you're at a transit stop there be, and you need to buy a pass, there'd be an opportunity to buy that pass at your station. And then most importantly, and I think one of the most effective things that also benefits the traveling public as well, as well would be signal priority. So what signal priority does is that if it, the, the, the bus will communicate with the signal and it will hold a green signal to allow uh, a bus to, to travel through uh, that, that signal during that, that green cycle. So those are some of the examples, but um, again, the power of this plan and the flexibility is that um, that will be on an intersection, intersection by basis, route by route basis to determine what best will impact the service on the particular route that the improvements are on. This is a little bit of a different twist on a question that we've had, which is, will fit local services continue to be designed, developed, and administered by the local providers DIA and SMART? Yes, absolutely yes. You didn't give me time to get another question out there. You answered that question too quickly. I figured you would have took that one. Yes, I started to, but I just want to make sure you're awake. You mentioned capital improvements on key pre premium corridors. Can you elaborate on what you have planned for that? Capital improvements on key premium corridors. Um, I think it's a question that we just we just answered in terms of um, the corridor. So again, um, uh, corridor by corridor basis, and I, I just gave a few examples of how uh, we hope to do that. Will there be any connector lines? Is the first question. The second is, will this millage be assisted? And there are two more, but we'll start with those two. Connector lines is to. Will there be any connector lines? Is the person who here? Would you like to elaborate? Connector lines are uh, many lines that connect the major lines to all the major lines. Yeah, sure. So um, the the existing and potentially expanded, you know, D dot smart um, bus service uh, could provide those connector services. Uh, we do have some limited connector services, uh, primarily around the commuter rail, uh, and it's uh, in Washtenaw County. Uh, we have some uh, commuter or uh, some connector bus services that would circulate uh, around and then pick up people and take them and um, uh, drop them off at the stations in conjunction with that sort of commuter express bus route. But um, ultimately. You know, what we're looking to uh, move forward with uh, expanded services, coordinated services, um, and you know, the existing underlying smart DDOT service um, needs to be you know, part of that. I don't know if you want to add One item I'd like to add to that is, you know, we do have the first mile, last mile option for the flexible mobility program. So rather than relying on a traditional uh, local connector to a major route. Um, there, there should be opportunities in this plan if um, first mile, last mile options with other providers are made available um, to have uh, a direct connection now. This is a very good question and one that we have heard. Right now, the various operators provide radically different experiences. What efforts will be made to ensure that an equitable and just is enforced across the different operators? Excellent question. Very. Um, you know, I think one of the things you've seen over a period of time, um, you know, especially since 2016, I look at, you know, the services and, and some of the um, experiences from uh, DDOT and SMART, and those services have continued to improve over time. Um, you know, I, I, can't, I can't predict the future, but uh, with additional resources, with additional amenities, um, you know, I know, you know our existing providers work very hard to provide the service that they can with the, the resources that they have today. And so I would expect that to continue. Um, you know, I don't know if they can. 
Um, a, a couple other pieces. So uh, certainly the uh, the seamless fare card um, will will uh, allow for a much more uniform experience, no matter what provider you're using. Uh, certainly the basis of the plan in uh, regionalizing a lot of the major routes where people are transferring between Smart and DOT will take away probably one of the largest headaches people people talk about in terms of regional services. So you'll have just one bus line that goes up and down the major corridors, so that kind of automatically reduces some of those uh, service issues and provides some regionalization to the system. This person had two good questions, and here's the second one. How would the RTA ensure a transparent and responsive management structure, especially regarding customer satisfaction? So one of the priorities of uh, the RTA um, has been and, and moving forward has to be um, that we deliver services um, with within the uh, framework that the both the state and federal law requires um, that means that we have to be good stewards of every penny that comes through our door and so um, you know that's a commitment that you know I will make when uh, I'm at RTA um, I know it's important to our board. We just had um, uh, our annual audit. We do go through auditing processes to make sure that it is transparent. Um, and our board, uh, I know that that's a very you know major priority for our board is to make sure that you know all the money because the RTA is the federal uh, recipient of dollars coming into the region. We want to make sure that you know. We're spending those dollars and getting more and more dollars. So um, we need to be organized and, and ready to implement these services um, and be very prudent with the dollars that come through our doors. We've touched on this quite before, um, but I'll read it anyway. And just, um, are you really prepared to proceed without the support of Oakland and Macomb County leaders if necessary? Um, and the person says that they personally support the plan. So thank you for that comment. Yes. Yeah, te well, te well, from a technical point of view, let's right. talk about it from the technical so, point of view. So from a technical point of view, and the purpose of this meeting um, is to get feedback from the public. So I can't sit here today and say we're going to do X, Y, and Z and move forward if, if you know certain people don't take certain action. action. So. Um, I was probably a little bit short with that response, but um, you know, we really want to hear the, the feedback from the comment. You know, the, the political winds that you know what they may be, you know, they will continue to blow. But you know, it's important from a technical standpoint that we have this open and honest dialogue, and you know, we want to hear that feedback tonight. If I could just address that, without that's that's where the supermajority requirement comes in. The plan the plan can't be placed on the ballot without support from. The Oakland and the co representatives are both Thank you, Joel. <laughs> I'm going to send you to the principal's office the next time you make a disruptive comment. Will there be transit police? Oh no, Joel. You you know I love you. You know I love you. So okay. proceeding onward. Will there be transit police? Yeah, so the uh, existing uh, providers have security. Uh, you know, they have transit police. Uh, the contract and service with them uh, would make sure that we have a safe and uh, reliable system. So um, it would be the anticipation that that would continue. If people live in the hometown services region, will they receive discounts on Uber, etc.? for their uh, millage payments versus residents outside of the four counties? I would say that's um, TBD. You know, what, one of the things that's you know, so unique about that program, it, it's really up to um, you know, those local communities to define. Certainly there's communities across the country that have implemented that type of Uber uh, Lyft um, subsidy to get that last mile to those um, regional services that are available in, in other parts of our country. Um, we're not far enough along 
to where we've gone out, but I'll let Ben talk about some of the conversations. Uh, both Ben and Jeremy have spent a lot of time talking with uh, elected and local officials in the hometown service area, so I'll, I'll let them both give their perspective. Uh, so in conversations with uh, communities in the hometown service areas, generally what they're, what they're interested in is expanding their existing uh, services for seniors and people with disabilities. Um, a lot of them have two or three vehicles that provide services for uh, people in their, just within their communities. Um, they're generally looking to get those vehicles replaced and all of them need to get at least one or two additional vehicles. They want to be able to expand the geographic footprint. They're not looking to go across the entire region, but to be able to go to a neighboring community. Uh, a lot of times neighboring communities are where the major um, health center is or hospital is. Um, so a lot of conversation around that, a lot of conversation around uh, providing uh, van services or other commute services for those um, kind of what I call sub-regional job centers. So for Troy, for people who live in Orion Township to get just to Troy. Um, some, some of the more urbanized townships are uh, looking at circulator services um, or connections into the major regional services. That's where a partnership with an Uber or Lyft would probably come in. Um, so we have had some conversations about, about that as well. I would also say for folks who are interested in how these types of partnerships work, um, the uh, Pinellas Suncoast Transit, which is in uh, Tampa, Florida, has a service called Direct Connect, um, and it basically provides a subsidized Uber trip. It's, you can either do Uber taxi or um, an ADA, a wheelchair accessible vehicle, um, and they provide those subsidized trips into their regional transit system. It's uh, one of the more unique programs I've seen and something that we'd be looking at implementing. So for those who are interested in doing further looking, Direct Connect services is an interesting model. So I like this question a lot because I think it leads to one of the greatest challenges in our region from a philosophical point of view and a historical point of view. So how will you ensure that transit is more desirable and effective than driving a car? And I say that it's sort of a philosophical question because in other regions, Taking transit is a natural part of everyday life, and in ours, it is not. So it, they're really, this is really a huge, huge question. You know, for example, it's quicker to, for me to ride, um, to drive than to take the queue line. So, so to answer that question, at least the first part of it, um, so it's about choices. It's about choices and options and, and you know, and about reliable service. Um, and when I say reliable, I'm, I'm not um, here to uh, say anything about the service again that DDOT is smart, but you know they don't have the resources to be able to provide those services throughout the day. So again, uh, these services that we're talking about, these expanded services uh, off peak, you know the same types of services that they provide during the peak period, we're talking about providing all throughout the day. So you have the greater choices to use the transit system to take you where you want to go, connecting east to west, north to south. Um, you have the commuter express, you have uh, the um, commuter rail. You have these choices that don't exist today. You know, we have one, one mode. Um, we just recently had a streetcar uh, added. Um, but that is, you know, we, we're very limited. So uh, we, need, we need more options. If I could just add to that, I mean, I think um, education is a big part of it. I mean, Matt talked about education earlier, but I mean, helping to change the mindset of members of our communities about educating them about not only the options, but uh, you know how it, riding transit can benefit your daily life. I mean, I, I'm a one-car family. My wife and I fight over who gets to ride the bus because that's an extra hour of our day where we could be doing other things besides being behind the wheel. And I think uh, Wayne State, um, they've got a Wayne Rides program, which I think is actually um, taking a very uh, interesting approach to educating folks. And it's, their goal is to get people on a transit vehicle just once. And they think if they can get them on that vehicle at least once to see that it's a viable alternative, that may be a choice for them uh, over the long term. So um, I think education is a big piece of changing the mindset of the folks who live in our region about transit. 
And I'll add to that. So when we first started this discussion, this transit discussion, community discussion in 2014, I would go to community meetings and I would say to people, my standard question was, so if we had a regional transit, how would you use it? And the question, the response that I got most often was, huh? Because people really weren't aware of what regional transit was. So fast forward now to 2018, and we've been through the millage and so forth. People are so much more educated now about regional transit than they were. Even though it doesn't seem sometimes that we've come a long way, trust me, we have come a very, very, very long way. So as Jeremy said, education, continuing education, all of your being here, all of your talking to your friends and, and in this conversation is how we're going to move the needle on that. So, what's the plan for transit-oriented transit development based on the framework? Another good question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, we do, um, you know, have in here uh, the planning type uh, studies that look at uh, opportunities to incorporate transit-oriented development. Um, actually. Moving forward right now, the RTA uh, is going to be putting out a couple of studies working in partnership with SMART um, to look at TLD um, opportunities along Woodward as well as Michigan Avenue. Um, that's more obviously longer term, but making sure that you know we have all the tools in the toolbox to help us uh, promote more of a urban, dense, walkable uh, community. Um, it's something that you know obviously is a priority, and so we're moving forward regardless of this plan. You know, I know it's a priority to the the other uh, providers. There'll be partners along the way. Um, can Grand River, Jefferson, and Van Dyke be part of the bus rapid corridor? And of course, we have added Grand River, have we not, to the list? So we can just address Jefferson and Van Dyke. Um, and this person also suggests uh, uh, bus rapid transit on I-75, I-94, and the Lodge freeways. So in regards to additions on the uh, 15 for 15 map, um, we go back one more. Uh, as you can see, uh, Jefferson, Van Dyke, and Grand River are, are all on there. So they are all part of the 15 for 15 network. Um, so they'll all be receiving that upgraded service. Um, in regards to uh, the interstates, um, the express service is uh, the closest thing that we have to address that. And we did hear um, that we need direct express service to job centers. Um, one of the things that, that we learned in 2016 is that 90% of the jobs in Southeast Michigan are not accessible within an hour's ride on transit. And so the 15 for 15 corridors are trying to address that, but also these express routes. And so. Um, uh, they're not high frequency, but they are high speed, uh, and they are limited stock. This is about signal prioritization. Um, this person says that they've heard that it took 12 agencies um, to coordinate the signals between the boulevard and downtown. <laughs> so they want how we plan to get this done with this much larger plan. Um, I, I, yeah, I can't um, speak to the 12 agencies and um, and Woodward, but um, you know, uh, the agencies that do uh, run our signals in this region are um, gaining more experience as it relates to signal priority and signal timing, and so uh, that's really a coordination effort. Uh, I think I don't want to speak for Matt and the RTA, but one of the RTA's role is to help facilitate uh, coordination. And, um, and so that, that would be a big part of the TSP uh, implementation. Uh, it would be uh, making sure that there's uh, cor uh, or, um, coordination amongst those who are operating on the same corridor in terms of uh, having responsibility for the signals. Fortunately, on the state routes, uh, MDOT um, would be able to play that role and would be able to take the lead on uh, signal priority for those corridors. I think this is a hometown question. Um, let's see. How, if at all, will the RTA participate in local route development within the core area? It's part one. And what is the RTA's stance on the development of localized transit authorities, such as the Royal Oak Transit Authority proposal? 
So uh, the uh, again, uh, we partially answered this question, I guess, earlier. The local route development and route decisions will still be governed by the, the local providers. Um, however, now that we have a regional system, we will be discussing um, you know, how best to make those changes to connect to the regional system to provide services that aren't provided by the regional system. So there will be a more robust discussion about service changes at the local level, uh, but they will ultimately be done by the providers. Um, uh, the RTA uh, has had a little bit of interaction with the City of Royal Oak and their local efforts. and. Um, I, I guess I won't speak for the agency, but I'm certainly supportive of any community that wants to look to, to, to you know, right. provide an investment to, to expand their transit services. I, I don't see why that would be an issue at all. Great. Does the plan include a system to give low-income citizens access to public transit? For example, will there be a program that has a sliding scale for fares? That's part one. And it's part two is some ride sharing drivers will not pick up in areas um, that have high crime. Does this plan account for that problem, and if so, how? Uh, so, so in terms of fares, the the, the fare policies would be uh, the same as Smart and DDOT's fare policies, which which require um, different uh, differential fares for income and uh, low income riders and seniors. Um, Part of uh, being able to provide, so it's a second question, part of having a public incentive is to work with companies to um, either have them provide those services, um, also providing a suite of services, so maybe if Uber, for whatever reason, doesn't want to provide services in high crime areas, taxi companies, other options may be available to do that, providing some public incentive to do that as um, actually a, a way that um, you can get that done. Uh, I won't, again, providing another example of just some research. Um, the LA taxi system is set up in a series of zones. Um, the most high pro highly profitable zone operates basically in the Hollywood area and in the airport. And what they do is they say, if you're going to operate in this zone and have a permit here, you also need to operate in another lower income zone and provide the same amount of service, otherwise you don't get a permit. I'm not saying that's part of the plan, but there are ways when you're involving public policy at the regional level that you can um, uh, even out those those uh, benefits. Okay. We've spoken a lot about what we can learn from other cities, but not so much about what other cities can learn from the work that the RTA is doing in Southeast Michigan through this plan. In other words, how can we establish ourselves as leaders in transit services instead of followers? So um, one of the things I really encourage about with this plan is the flexible services, particularly the advanced mobility program. Um, every single transit provider, every single local municipality in the United States that's dealing with transportation is struggling mightily with how do we um, become leaders in this area. Um, and right now what we're seeing is private companies basically getting into the space, doing whatever it is they want to do and, and, and can do, um, but not a lot of coordination, not a lot of discussion of what are the public benefits of these technologies. This is the largest investment, pub, you know, proposed public investment in trying to have the public sector play an active role in how these technologies are deployed. So um, I think as we further develop this program, and talk about how we can use the incentives from this program to develop those technologies, we will absolutely be leaders in that space. Okay. I like this question. To follow up on the Boston streetcar comparison, I have lived and worked in Dorchester. Who is that? I say, uh, hey. I say hey from Brighton. I live there, and I lived in Brookline, I lived in Cambridge. Uh, your answer seems incomplete, as you seem to be equating their streetcars with our beloved and lightning fast queue line. No, I am not doing that. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I, I didn't do that. Um, let's see, is the queue line a fast, reliable RTA component? If not, how can it become more effective, faster, and extensive? So, so the plan does accommodate um, and allow for uh, assuming operations of the Q line in 2027. Um, at, until that point in time, the operations are managed um, day to day by uh, M1 Rail, and so that's what's in the, the current plan. 
And we are down to our last question, and right on time, it is 7.30. Where do the promotion and marketing budgets lie? Is the RTA responsible for the promotion of sources over the separate contracted service providers? Yeah, I think the two separate questions. Where do the promotion and budgets lie? So the plan uh, allows for, thank you. Um, you know, the plan provides for um, you know administrative functions, and certainly that would be one of the things that you know each of the um, uh, transit providers uh, they do today, and so you know it would provide um, resources for them to do more of that. Um, so that would likely be housed um, you know, at each agency. However, there's there's certainly benefits and economies of scale of looking at some of that more regionally. And so, you know, if this plan is successful, um, we'll be working with our providers to look at where it makes more sense to do that on a region base versus a provider by provider base. Okay, and this person also wants to know, is the art responsible for the promotion of new services or the separate contracted or I think they want to know, or is that contracted to, to separate providers, service providers? I think you've sort of answered that a bit. Yeah, yeah I think so. Okay, all right. So, so no action has been taken yet, and so the, the operations. So the operations of the. Okay. Yeah. So the operations of the queue line is included in this version of the plan, and you know obviously a, a vote will you know have to take place um, on whether or not this plan moves forward. to the, the question. All right, we're gonna, we are going to take a couple of comments and then we're going to wrap it up because it's past 7 30.
So the question is, um, for those of you in the back of the room, um, the plan includes both uh, bus express service um, from Ann Arbor to Detroit, and, but uh, in the interim in 2019, when does the actual commuter rail service begin? And Jeremy, um, I believe that answer is 2022? 2022. We're going to take two more comments and then we're going to wrap it up for the night. And if you and we are going to be outside, so if you have questions, you can actually come out and ask us. But we'll take these two questions and then we're going to wrap it up. No, no, we, there's no such list out there. That happens at the RTA board meetings, but that does not happen here. That there is no list out there. No. Yes, ma'am. The plan itself, yeah, I think they've had a lot of input and uh, the components of the plan, yes, it's, a, it's an improvement. Thank you all so very much for coming out tonight. We really appreciate your input. As I said. And we will be out in the atrium for a while, so if you have other questions and you want to speak one-on-one, -on -one, please do so. Thank you.